Okay. Good. Global energy and industry and disruptive transformation. So this is what I'll be talking about. Uh, the background to LNG, the value chain and what that is. And then looking at what the LNG business looked like traditionally. And we're going back something like 15 years. We're going to look at what energy markets are and what drives the change. So a bit of theory and then looking at how this has affected LNG, the liquefied natural gas business. The new players, something about hubs and pricing, and then we will think about the future. Okay, the traditional business. Oh dear, this is just stopped again. Oh dear, my uh, this is just crashed again. Here we are. Oh gosh, what's happened? My apologies, it just crashed again. Okay, this is a tiny bit of the engineering for you that. Um, LNG is natural gas supercooled to minus 161, where it becomes a liquid. And two types of shipping vessel, double hold vessel, and they're all double hold. And there's two types, the membrane, membrane design you see the top two and MOSFET design the bottom two. Uh, the LNG value chain basically is, is looking at uh, the whole business from production, you can see the gas fields here on the left, to um, gas gathering pipelines, processing the gas transport system to liquefaction plants, where it's a liquid, and then as a liquid transported on ship, put onto ships, taken around the world, and as a liquid, discharged as a liquid. So we've got the upstream here on the left, midstream the shipping and um, into LNG tanks as a liquid transport system within the country and then as regasified gas and then into customers that's the downstream that's the value chain so traditionally there are three types of um, industry player producers and liquefaction terminals these were the big IOCs Shell Chevron Exxon Mobil and so on and, uh, and they usually had their own liquefaction terminals. They're big shipping companies, often usually uh, subsidiaries of the, um, of the IOCs. Shell shipping, Shell LNG shipping was the biggest one in the world. And then na large national buyers, uh, Tokyo, Gas, Osaka, um, and, um, and then Co-Gas for um, South Korea. For example, so large national bias from governments. And that was the business, very simple. Few players, major producers, shipping companies, buyers. They, they, it was very rigid business term. Um, Long-term contracts, we're talking about 20 to 40 years. Rigid contracts, destination clauses. This means that in the contract, it specifies where the gas is to be delivered. So there's not much room for trading and, um, and moving gas around, selling to different people, because it's specified in the contract. It goes from this place to that destination and nowhere else. Take or pay, really, it's um, take and pay. It's a contractual term. It means that you have to pay for the gas, whether you're actually able to take it or not. Um, say, say you're a, a big national buyer and there's no market, there's a recession or, it's, um, or something happens and you can't put the gas into the market, so you don't take it. But take or pay means you have to pay anyway, regardless whether you take or pay. Whether you take or not, you still have to pay, so really it's take and pay. Uh, little trading, there were no 
standard contracts. Each contract was negotiated individually, often over a period of um, several years. Fancy financial derivatives, futures forwards and so, so on, certainly not. Pricing was negotiated, um, as I said, often over a few years, um, often by indexation. So the gas price moved in relation to how something else moved, usually the oil price. And these were hidden, opaque. So you could not see what was, um, there was no transparency to the process. That was the traditional industry structure. And we're talking about, as I said, 15 years ago. 2004 is a good example of before the change. There are two basins. Uh, LNG basically works in two global areas, the Atlantic Basin and, and Pacific. Because um, pipeline gas uh, over very long distances, it becomes uneconomic to move it. So they use LNG in ships, which can um, economically travel much further than pipeline gas. However, there are still costs of moving gas by LNG around the world, the shipping costs, insurance costs for the shipping. And despite the strong membrane double hull design, there is still some small leakage. So the further you take gas by ship and the longer it takes, the, the more leakage there is, the more the costs go up. So LNG tends to be served within its own region. So you can see the Pacific side, um, west or right of Africa, there's a, a, a basin there, and then another lot in the east of Africa, um, North America, South America, and Europe. Um, those are, that's another set of markets. Qatar nicely lying in between, so it's able to serve both markets, moving gas through the Suez Canal. Okay, it, this was what the world looked like then, just 12 producers, Indonesia, Malaysia were the biggest ones, also Algeria, Qatar. USA is a small producer, U the United States and Libya about um, one or so billion cubic meters between them. So the UN United States was not uh, um, a gas producer for export then. And you can see here that in fact, in 2004, uh, there's some volumes going into America. So America then was just starting to import um, LNG. And that was the big hope at that point. You can see here the major players in um, 2004, uh, the orange is Japan, and that was the major consumer, something like 40% of global LNG consumption was just in Japan. And the second big market was South Korea, the mottled um, stripy blue there. And the bottom Europe, basically that's Spain, a small amount from France, even smaller amounts from the UK. But basically, um, Spain was the third major LNG consumer in the world. And that was it. You had three major um, consumers, a few other with bits and pieces. And you see the black at the top just starting to emerge, the United States. And this was the hope then that you, the United States would become the big new gas importer. And on the back of that, something like 12 LNG import facilities were built um, along the, uh, the east coast of America. Because in, back in 24, 2004, the world thought that the United States would become the biggest LNG importer. How wrong forecasters can be, eh? Uh, here's a case study, Spain in 2004, before the changes, you can see pipeline gas and LNG, um, two thirds of Spain's imports from LNG. Although Spain, looking at a map, it's part of Europe. The Pyrenees uh, is a mountain range separating France from Spain. So it, in an economic sense, and in a gas sense, Spain is like an island. The, the land border connections with France for gas are very small. So it imports gas mostly by LNG. 
um, and most of that from Algeria and some amounts from um, Algeria by pipeline. You see here Norway 2.19, that's it. That was um, Norwegian gas by pipeline transited through France. Out of the total um, 9.2 billion cubic meters, just uh, I don't know, 20% was, was pipeline imports from Europe. The rest uh, was um, from Algeria and two thirds, 27, seven, sorry, 17 billion cubic meters from uh, by LNG. Okay, uh, that's, um, so Spain was not happy with this being at the end of uh, a closed link through France. Spain wanted liberalization. Spain has been very keen to see LNG markets opening up. So what, why is it different now? What are the things that drive change in an energy market? So the obvious things you need for an energy market are many suppliers and you need many customers. Then you need something, customer pressure, dissatisfaction with the status quo or some industry crisis or something that prompts a change. Uh, then there are other characteristics of active trading markets, um, many supplies from many different sources, flexibility in supplies, weather, and all these things that means there is likely to be an imbalance between supply and demand. So you need a market or something to balance that. Competition between different um, suppliers and different networks, pipelines or different LNG routes. So I think all of these apply to LNG. So back in 2004, the ingredients were there for a, a LNG market, but it wasn't happening. Why wasn't it happening? There were, of course, there were very few players and you know, big IOCs and national governments, the, um, uh, the big costs to entry. You, know, you needed a few billion dollars to set up a liquefaction plant hundreds of millions for an LNG um, regasification. Even if you did all of that, it still wouldn't work because you needed access to LNG ships, which were largely owned by the, um, by the IOCs. So the barriers to entry were high, a concentration of players, the rigidity of contracts. And some people were saying, is LNG actually suitable to be traded? You know, um, gas goes through pipelines and Active trading markets have emerged in Europe, Australia, um, 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 and North and South America, uh, not very much, but to a, some extent in Japan and South Korea, although not really. But uh, you could say, well, pipeline gas goes in a flow. It can, it's suitable to be um, traded and uh, to become a market. But LNG comes in a block in a ship. And this is by its very nature, it's something quite different. Well, that was, is or was a view of certain analysts. It's not my view, but some people would say that. So just to remind yourselves, what are the three things that drive a market? We said many suppliers, many customers, a customer pressure or an industry crisis. So some crisis that drives a change then the environment is created by government. If you imagine in um, historic times, the Lord in his, um, in his castle would, um, he would offer protection for the local people and he would have his soldiers around and some basic laws. And then a market would develop outside the, uh, the forts or the city gates. So that's the government creating the regulatory and security and fiscal environment. But that's all governments can do. Markets develop by themselves. Governments can put the framework in place, but it is up to individual buyers and sellers to make a market. So how did this apply to energy? So you have an oversupply of gas is one thing. What was the market crisis? Uh, in, if we go back a few years, I know things have changed a lot in the last two years, but let's go back to the... Um, uh, say the early, um, around 2010, something like that. 
Uh, no, um, more than that. Say 2015, 2020, 2018, before the pandemic came along. Analysts were saying, uh, we looked at this in 2017 a lot before the pandemic. That's a good term to think about. So um, there was a lot of LNG was being produced, a lot of gas, more gas than there were markets. So everyone was saying that there's a supply overhang. There is more supply of LNG around than there is markets. Now, an LNG um, tanker could always find a market. Um, that is until March 2020. There was something like 54 at one point. There were 54 LNG tankers floating around the world without being able to find a market for their gas. But apart from that um, one-off event then, cargoes have always found a market. Of course, it depends on the price. So if there's an excess of supply driving down prices, this is generally seen in economic terms as a, as a driver for market change. Then there were many new technologies. We will look at those just now. Government regulations. The United States um, allowed LNG exports before gas could only be allowed within the United States. So there was a, um, in the 2010s, there was a change of regulations that allowed exports. The ship fueling regulations came in just a year ago. Um, Desulfurization means that um, basically all shipping fuels have to change. They have to get low sulfur um, uh, um, um, shipping fuel or, or find another um, or, or find another type of fuel. So this was a big market opportunity for um, LNG as, as a fuel as a shipping fuel. And then regulatory changes. The, the European Union had for many years um, through the various gas directives since the early 2000s had been removing destination clauses for pipeline gas. Um, Russia, which supplies most um, a large amount of European gas, um, had these destination clauses. The European Union um, banned those. And it took some years, but these, th these clauses came into effect. The European Union then, in around 2016, uh, made this for LNG as well. So any LNG destined to Europe, they may not specify the destination. So therefore, any, any gas to Europe, you, um, it can be bought and sold en route. It can be transferred to any other destination. And then in 2017, the um, EU did a deal with um, Japan, and, and they agreed that as well. So Japan and the European Union together this is something like more than half of global LNG demand. Um, so a significant block, and they have banned destination clauses. So these are key government regulatory drivers. Then the market actions, new players came along, and then, uh, which we will look at just now, and then what we could say is luck contingency. Uh, the US shale, uh, the discovery of US tight oil and shale gas meant that suddenly there was large amounts of low cost United States gas. And as we said, there were these many liquefaction terminals and so regasification terminals had been built in the expectation of the United States becoming an LNG importer. So what to do with all of those now? LNG had such enormous amounts of its own gas. Well, it's far cheaper to convert to liquefaction terminal, so to convert an import regasification terminal into an export liquefaction one. It's far easier to convert than to build a new liquefaction terminal. So that's what they did. They, uh, these um, various US companies bought up these terminals and converted them. So now suddenly, and this is why I say contingency or luck, you have large amounts of low cost LNG from the United States that are ready to be um, sent around the world. And at the United States, US um, commercial terms as well. So suddenly there was going to be a big 
um, assault on this traditional coated structure. So we talked about drivers of change as, as technology, um, FSRUs, floating storage and regasification units, floating LNG, uh, so this is regasification and liquefaction on, on boats, which means that the cost of regasification and liquefaction go down dramatically. Even more than that, because it's on a boat, you, could, um, you can move it away. So from a few hundred million dollars, you could, you could get an FSRU for 50 million, which means all sorts of new markets are opening up, Middle East and Africa. Um, an African country, Ghana, for example, would, uh, would hire an FSRU from a company, one of the new developers, uh, it's $50 million. If anything happens and they, um, they don't use it, then it, it's not an issue for the, I mean, it is an issue, but it's not much of an issue for the, um, for the company supplying that FSR. They can just take it away again. And that's exactly what happened in Ghana. Um, they, they took an FSRU, but the Ghana government had overestimated the demand for gas. So it was unused. So the supplier, Gola, I think it was, just took it away. So that flexibility and low cost opens up all sorts of new emerging market markets. And then QMAX, Qatar Max, these are big 300,000 um, ton vessels. On the other hand, mini LNG, liquefaction, distribution, we will look at these where you get small little trucks of um, taking 22 um, tons LNG on a lorry on that you can drive far inland around the country. Bunkering, so this is moving gas from LNG from ship to ship, ship to shore, short-term storage. So all sorts of new low-cost opportunities opening up. We have to think about the impact of climate change regulation and all the new commercial practices from the United States that I mentioned. Here we are, I'll race through this, but the, the technology um, changes here. And you can see bottom left, you can move LNG not by a big ship, as a, but, uh, but, through a, but through a lorry, a truck with a, um, a trailer on the back. New players, uh, traditional producers still there, liquefaction terminals, the traditional buyers. New shipping companies, Nakilat. Uh, was only founded in 2004, and now uh, with 64 ships, it's the biggest shipping company in the world. The IOCs have lost their hold over shipping. Aggregators, big companies uh, that buy LNG from many sources and supply to many different customers. New US exporters, Chenier, for example, the FSRUs, Golar and Herg, New national buyers from uh, emerging markets, Pakistan, Ghana, I mentioned. Um, so emerging market buyers, um, India, of course, is taking off as a, as a big new energy importer. And the traders, um, Trafigura, VTOL, they've moved into this as well. And then right at the other end, small scale, mini and micro LNG. So it's really opened up with all these new flyers. And they're all doing different things. You know, buyers, national buyers are now selling. Exporters, traditional exporters are importing. Much more flexibility in contracts. Prices have been renegotiated. And so on. Uh, racing on. This is what the world looks like now. Uh, sorry, this is to remind you of before. 2004. Just 12 producers in two basins. And half a dozen um, buyers. And now it's, it's much more complex. You've got exports from the United States, Australia, Qatar. They are the main producers, the exporters of LNG. New buyers that didn't even exist 15 years ago, China and India. New markets. Demand in Europe stays pretty flat. It doesn't, uh, it stays roughly the same. So in this, the blue is the LNG and red are flows of pipeline gas. 
and um, South America has opened up as a as a importer and exporter of LNG as well. Uh, you see here now exports from um, so Middle East. This is Qatar has has was there in 2004, but it's really taken off now. And then um, North America, that's the United States is the light screen. I'm looking at the left hand slide here, chart. The light green is the United States. And from this year, just now, um, like a month or so ago, the United States did become the biggest LNG and exporter in the world. So from being forecast to be an importer is now the biggest exporter in the world. But the United States market is large, even though it supplies more exports more than anyone else, including Qatar. It's still something like 15% of the United States market. So we'll think about that in a moment. Other producers, uh, Australia, the dark green, that's picking up. So those are the three main ones. And then other producers as well. Africa, Nigeria, and um, Equatorial Guinea, and Mozambique is likely to be starting off. Imports, um, China, we see the blue, and from, from nothing in 2004 is now a major buyer. The other Asia, that's um, Japan and South Korea, are still there, the yellow. Um, sorry, that's the green. Other Asia, all, all the other. Asian countries importers. Um, India, um, there and, and will be growing. Um, uh, oh, we see the green there, still the same. Japan and South Korea. So the developed markets and Europe as well, more or less staying the same. There's, you're not seeing any growth from Europe um, and the traditional markets. But new emerging markets are where all the growth is, is coming from, and most, mostly in, um, in Asia, but all over the world as well. Okay, I mentioned hubs. What is a hub? Um, time is short, so I'll go through this. I won't spend time on this, but a hub is where gas um, comes into a central point, prices can be set in a market, and then it moves out in another direction. The red are the three main existing hubs, pipeline gas. Green is where I, um, blue rather is, is where I think new hubs could develop. And we've got three possibles in Asia, but I think none of them are really satisfactory, to be honest. None of them are really quite taking off. And then green is where I think there could be bunkering. Um, so where there are big ports and you can have ship to ship transfers. Um, and some potential points there. Singapore is is um, is a you know, trading culture, and I, and um, Singapore has a large port, and Singapore has done a lot to try to make put in the environment for an LNG hub. Uh, it's it's looks very likely to me. However, Singapore is a small country, only three million people, and is it really big enough to be a, a global center for LNG trade? I don't know. JKM, it's a price setting point. It's not really a, a hub. There isn't the culture of trading in Japan and even less so in uh, Shanghai. So lots of gas goes through Shanghai more than anywhere else. But its prices are regulated, set by government. It's, uh, you can't call this a trading hub. So that's uh, just racing through these very quickly. Prices, have, look at this, all over the place. The yellow and orange is for gas prices at Japan. So you can see in the middle, 2011 to 2014, they were very high, over $15 per million cubic meters. Uh, sorry, dollars per million British thermal units, MMBTU. The red down the bottom is the United States, Henry Hub, and you can see that they're low and less volatile. There's more, more even price. And Japan is high, but also it goes up and down. Europe are the greens in the middle. So price, it's a high point in 2012, 2014, and then it plunged down. Now what's happening now? This is the World Bank forecast. 
uh, so just before the pandemic, they were thinking, what's price going to be last year? They predicted prices 2.8 last year, they said, but uh, they um, not really it hit six. And this was the um, Henry Hub. Now, so the point of this is that the agencies try to forecast the prices, but even within a few months, they managed to get it completely wrong. Um, we, I don't think we can put much credence on what forecasters say. But look at Henry Hub, natural gas price. So I've added these in since I first put these slides together because of what's been happening with the gas price crisis and energy crisis this year. So you can see uh, the Henry Hub United States gas prices from $10 back in 2010 and went right down to 2022, $2.5. That was the lowest point. And then it shot up with the gas price crisis to six, six and a half. It touched six and a half dollars. It's gone down now at about three, four, about four and a half dollars now, something like that. So it's um, so the big rise shoot up in 2021 from two and a half to six and a half. But so what? Compare that with uh, Europe. This is the Japan. <laughs> South Korea prices um, shot up to what well, 50 was the peak now something like 30 um, in the 30 to 35 range so 10 times Japanese prices and European prices are the same are 10 times the prices in the United States so this is bizarre um, I said that the United States is the biggest LNG exporter in the world but the prices are set by basically weather forecasts over the next two weeks in, in um, New York. So this is the situation now that LN US exports, are, um, which will have, have such an influence around the world are based on New York weather forecasts. Another thing, you can see the orange at the bottom on the right, at the bottom, low, and then um, European and Japanese prices much higher. So what does this mean for the future? We don't know. Uh, excess supply, that's what we said just before the pandemic, there will be more supply than demand of LNG until the mid or the end of the 2020s, despite emerging market growth. The United States remains the largest marginal and the, the marginal supplier and the largest supplier, which means the United States should be setting the price for or gas. Europe is like a commercial battleground between the United States and Russian LNG versus Russian pipeline gas. And then, and then COVID came along. So we, not just COVID, but the, um, the energy transition and the concerns about the um, environmental impact of fossil fuels. Underinvestment and caution. Um, I've been following this very closely, and um, there has been a lot of underinvestment the last two years. Um, US shale gas has retreated, although it, on the current high prices, it may well start off again. So we shall see what happens. And the environmental concerns, the energy transition. Basically, underinvestment should lead to higher prices. So, what will happen? Will it be low for long? high for long, will they return to that trend? Will US and global prices converge? US prices go up and the rest of the world goes down. These are all good questions. Um, and then the technology has an important part. Uh, bunkering, mini and micro energy, reducing costs, and we will get fancy trading derivatives in due course. A couple of case studies very quickly. The Nigeria. Uh, so the two things, a number of things have happened in Nigeria. Uh, it's um, gas flare commercialization program. So this is a commercial program to reduce gas flaring. Nigeria, one of the big um, LNG, um, gas and LNG producers. 
so there's a lot of flare gas. They're saying, let's, instead of putting penalties, let's give incentives for um, companies to develop projects to um, put flare gas, to process it and clean it up and put it into markets. And several mini and micro liquefaction plants to, to cover um, mid, small, um, small power plants. And then virtual pipelines, you can see at the top up there, an LNG truck, 22 tons. We did some work for them last year. Uh, I think it's a wonderful idea. You've got 300 of these trucks taking LNG around markets right up into the north of Nigeria that had not had any gas at all. So that um, this micro, um, uh, mini and micro um, distribution means that LNG can reach far inland. One of those, uh, one of those trucks can drive 1,200 kilometers before it needs to fill up. So 600 kilometers takes you through yeah, most countries you can get right the way across it and back on, on one tank load. So the, suddenly the whole country is opened up and neighboring countries um, in, inside um, West Africa, Niger, Benin, Burkina Faso, other countries inland. Okay, and look at another case study, Afghanistan. Now, this is a, you might think this is a bizarre example, so, yes, but the point is that we were doing some work. Um, there, there was, there are, there are gas fields in Afghanistan and there was gas production. They wanted to know how to price it. And we said you should price off the nearest competitive market, which is northern Pakistan. So uh, you price at a level that you could supply the north Pakistan market. Now, Pakistan is supplied by LNG that's um, taken into Karachi and then been um, transported up the across the country. And in fact, they are at, in the process of building um, a dedicated LNG pipeline for regasified LNG from Karachi on the coast right up to the north of the country. And of course, so we're pricing Afghanistan gas on the price of um, LNG um, imported into Karachi. So again, we looked at Henry Hub plus the cost of getting it there, liquefaction and transportation, or uh, pricing against uh, where they get the gas from, which was um, Abu Dhabi. So LNG right into the heart of Asia. Conclusions. Traditionally a cozy club with high barriers to entry. Drivers for change from technology, government regulations, and then markets opening up, particularly that lucky coincidence of vast amounts of low cost shale gas in the United States combined with cheap, low cost liquefaction. The result a new industry and global LNG is now being disruptive and transformed. When people talk about disruptive transformation. It's a, it's a popular buzzword now. And people think about um, you know, Uber, taxis and smartphones and things like this. And I'm saying this term applies to a major industry, not just uh, smaller retail products. What do you do now? This won't stop. There will be further industry disruption. Um, uh, you should be urged to look at your previous projects and identify value. Gas flare sites or um, liquefaction areas that were previously stranded, that is, they were far away, it was not economic to develop them. Mini and micro liquefaction in far inland or offshore sites that were inaccessible before. Look at them again. And demand. LNG can now reach far inland, um, be in the whole of Myanmar or the whole of Thailand can be met from, um, uh, from um, an LNG facility. Okay, thank you. That's um, 